Hi everyone, welcome. Uh, today I'm going to talk to you about uh, a new specification that we're working on under the Open API initiative called the Workflows specification. So I'm going to dig into the what and why of the specification and let you ponder if it really is uh, the missing piece of the API puzzle. And we'll explore certain ways and certain dimensions with regards to how it can improve the experience for consumers and producers, both directly and also indirectly through the tooling that will be built. And a little warning up front, uh, you're gonna see some YAML and arguably some bad memes along the way. So my name is Frankel Commons. I'm a principal API technical evangelist at Smarper. I'm a developer and software architect by trade and have a great passion for APIs. I work quite a lot with the Open API Initiative and work uh, also quite a bit on the workflow specification as part of the special interest group focusing on it. So what we're going to cover in the next uh, 20 minutes or so is uh, I'll fill you in on what the workflow specification is. We'll discuss some of the use cases that uh, the working group have been focused on with regards to this first version. I'll then take you through the structure of the specification so that you can become a little bit more familiar with it. And then we'll apply it to a real world example. So I'll bring it to life a little bit for you. Now, first things first, why do we think we need something like this across the API industry uh, at the end of 2023? Well, what I still see every day is that companies are using APIs without having any proper documentation. And if you're doing so while well, your house really is on fire, you know, it hinders the ability for your teams to discover the APIs. It thus hinders the adoption of APIs, because if you build APIs and other teams can't find them, then they're not going to be used. And ultimately, that will impact the success of an API and maybe even more broadly, a whole API program. Now, you might say, Frank, you know, relax, you know, we, we understand this. We're using well-known specifications like OpenAPI and Async API to document and design the different flavors of APIs that we may be delivering. But what I would say is that we're still seeing that even with this ability, uh, the, the actual experience being delivered is subpar in, in many cases. And we're seeing an alignment gap happening across the industry. And this is apparent to us in some of the research we do at SmartBear. Uh, so we are seeing what's known as, or what we're referring to as the alignment gap. So only 48% of those surveyed are confident that the APIs that they're delivering are well-documented and actually explain the business value that's on offer. And we're seeing approximately 43% are unsure that they have the processes in place to deliver on the developer experience that they themselves would expect if they put themselves in the consumer seat. Now, having APIs, of course, is absolutely necessary if you want to participate in, in the digital economy. And it's a great way to start leveraging those capabilities that you have on offer. Um, but more often than not, when it comes to interacting with APIs, you need to do more than just one thing. So you must do a sequence of steps in order to achieve some value oriented use case or to be able to extract value out of the API. And so far across the industry, we don't really have much help from specifications to help describe how this can be done. Thus, the workflows specification has been crafted under uh, the Open API Special Interest Group. And the workflow specification it itself describes an approach to document use case oriented workflows in a programmatical readable format. And a workflow is nothing more than a series of API calls which together accomplish some business objective. Now we see that the additional human readable nature improves the ability for documents crafted using that specification to tell the story of an API and in a manner that can really elevate the consumer experience. Now thinking about use cases, and we've worked quite hard as a working group to, to kind of prioritize the different use cases that we're focusing on. And the ones that we're focusing on for the first iteration of the workflow specification are as follows. So we really see it as offering the ability to provide deterministic recipes for the use of APIs. So be that to make sense of large unwieldy uh, API descriptions that might have 10, 20, even 50 or 100 different endpoints in it, but also bridging the very common scenario where business flows span more than a single API document or description. We really think workflows can improve the ability to have what we call living API documentation to improve the consumer experience. And we know that what's happening all of the time is that yes, we have described APIs using open API, for example, 
then we will onboard consumers to get access to this API. We will give them access to those technical reference documents, but we will accompany that with lots of other flavors of documents that are crafted in more human uh, friendly approaches. So be it Word documents, be it PDF, whatever the case may be. And as soon as we write those things down, they inevitably become pretty stale. And we want to be able to have documents that can actually truly tell the story of these APIs and be able to assert the business value of those APIs. This is even more relevant when we start dealing with lots of different microservices, which together will offer an overarching business value proposition. But how can we assert that if we make any changes that across all of these things, the business value is still achievable? When it comes to code generation, we see a real advantage for having targeted SDK or code gen off workflows documents, which are driven predominantly by the business oriented use cases. So yes, you can generate code off, for example, an open API document or an async API document, but that's gonna spit out code based on all of the endpoints that are there, based on all of the schemas that are, are there. So your code may be quite bloaty if you're only focusing on one or two endpoints, whereas leveraging the workflows document, you will generate code specifically for that business use case, and you will not be distracted by all of the other endpoints that may happen to be in the same API document. We're also working with lots of different regulatory uh, bodies to uh, talk about the ability for workflows to uh, allow these bodies to assert uh, checks across the different providers that operate within those regulatory areas. Take, for example, open banking. So be able to actually validate if banks are providing APIs conforming to the regulatory requirements in that particular um, location. We're also very excited about the potential for um, all of the innovation that's happening within AI. So really allowing AI models to have a mechanism to extract value through interaction with workflows. So rather than having to maybe customize how we're delivering our APIs or to decorate our APIs with lots of custom attributes, we now can have something that is very, very easy for the different um, AI companies to build a natural language layer on top of. And again, this will be interoperable. So we don't have to do something different for every single uh, AI uh, model that's out there. So now let's jump into the specification itself and understand the structure. So hopefully you're familiar with this type of graphic. If you're familiar with OpenAPI or Async API, you're gonna see lots of similarities as we walk through this. So first things first, we have uh, the info object, and this is just metadata about the specific uh, workflows description or document itself. And if we take a look at what that looks like, <coughs> excuse me, it'll have a title, a summary, a description, and then it will have the version of the specific document itself. At the top here, just to be clear, we're also decorating this file with the version of the workflow specification that we're talking about. And right now we're working on 1.0.0 of the workflow specification. Next up, we have the source descriptions, and this lists the various other API documents like an open API description that can be referenced by one or, one or more workflows within the current workflow that we're describing. So this sets the boundary or the scope with regards to where and what the workflows can operate over. If we take a look at what this might look like here, for example, I'm pulling in two APIs and I'm setting that as the scope for the workflow. So I have a pets API and an adoptions API, and they're both open API documents, <coughs> excuse me. Next up, we have the workflow itself, and this just describes the workflows to be taken across one or more APIs to achieve that business value outcome. Uh, so each workflow will have an ID, it'll have a summary, a description, it will then have input steps and outputs, which I'll get into uh, in a moment. Inputs, so these are JSON schema objects that will be required for the uh, workflow to get up and running. So some workflows might need an API key or they might need some other um, static information that will be required and can't be uh, dynamically determined by the workflow itself. So the inputs allows whatever piece of software or whatever client will be invoking or asserting the workflow will be able to pass these things in. And here's what it looks like. So this is just an example of a JSON schema object. So here we have uh, the API key, category, breed, location, defined as properties in the input object. And we can also uh, describe which ones are required. So again, just standard JSON schema uh, structures. 
We then have the steps, and these are the defined workflow steps. So each step will represent a call to an API or indeed to another workflow if we've got to the point where we're chaining workflows together. So each step, again, will have an ID, it'll have a description, it will then have a way of referencing something. So in this instance, it'll have an operation ID, and this particular uh, step is referencing the get pets operation in the pets API that we will have listed in the source descriptions. We could also have an operation reference or we could have a workflow ID and they're all mutually exclusive to each other. We'll then have parameters. So these are parameters that will then be passed into the, the operation or the workflow that's been referenced. It'll have success criteria on success, things to do on failure and it'll have outputs that it will spit out at the end of the workflow. And we'll get into some of those now. So again, here we have parameters uh, and the parameters are defining what will be passed to that referenced operation. So here I'm saying we will have a category that will be passed as a query parameter into the targeted API. And the value that we'll be passing in, in this instance is the inputs dot category. So again, that would be something that would have been passed into the workflow itself. So again, no surprises here. And it's possible to describe uh, parameters that are either in query, uh, in header, in cookie, in path, um, in the request body itself, or even uh, will be an input for another workflow if you're chaining workflows together. Moving on to the failure actions. So this is an array of failure action objects that specify what should happen if the step fails. So if the step fails, what actions should happen, maybe to try to recover, or maybe to do something else uh, based on a particular condition. So um, there's various possibilities within the failure action objects themselves. So here we're seeing the type being retry. So that means in this instance, we will retry the step after 1000 uh, milliseconds up to a limit of five times. And we will continue to do that up to five times if we're getting a 500 or sorry, a 503 status code back from uh, the API operation that we're referencing. The other types of failure um, objects or failure types are end. So that means if a particular condition is met, then the workflow step will stop. And uh, we can also have go to. So for example, if we already determined that we have something and we can skip a couple of steps, we can go to a particular step that's happening later in the workflow. Success objects are very, very similar to failure objects. It's just things to do based on, again, certain success criteria um, of the step itself. So again, looking at this particular scenario, um, it has a type go to, and it's uh, determining the step that we should go to, and it will go there if uh, we're matching the particular criteria in the current step itself. Moving along, then we have outputs, and outputs are nothing more than a, um, a map object between a friendly name and a dynamic uh, output value that we want to um, make available within the context of the workflow for subsequent steps that are going to be uh, executed. <clears throat> so again, very simple structure here. We're defining an output uh, of a pet ID, and we're in injecting a value which will be determined based on this runtime uh, expression. We then also have outputs at the workflow level itself. So these are outputs that we want to return outside of the context of the workflow. So to the calling client application um, or CI process or whatever uh, will be invoking the workflow itself. Again, very similar structure, outputs, and then a key map between names and actual dynamic values. Okay, so let's now try to apply the workflows um, specification to a particular use case and we'll create a, a workflows document or description for that use case. So let's assume that we are working for a company called Petco, and the problem that we're trying to solve is we're being overwhelmed by the number of pets being abandoned at our pet store. So we've done our research and we've decided that we need some APIs and we're going to offer a service to search for and adopt pets that we catalog. We'll offer this to our own website, but we'll also offer the API externally towards a different and broader ecosystem of shelters, charities, and pet orphanages. So we've done all of our API design work and created our APIs, and we've actually crafted two different APIs, one for the pets resource and one for adoptions resource. So they're, they're independently managed by different teams, and we have different uh, open API descriptions um, describing what those interfaces can do. 
Now, an example for the workflows use case here would be, well, we want to describe to these third party shelters and charities actually how they can go about adopting a pet matching specific criteria. And the steps that we've decided that should be part of that workflow is step one, we should search for a pet. Then we should initiate adoption request once we found a matching pet. We then want to confirm the adoption by updating the status of an adoption that will have been registered. And then finally, we want to make sure that we can go back and verify that the pet status itself has been updated in the catalog to now state that it's adopted. So it's not showing up in any more available searches. So again, we can use uh, the workflows specification to describe all of those steps and how to interact with the different endpoints in our pets API or our adoptions API very, very uh, explicitly so that there's no ambiguity for consumers of uh, these APIs within the, the third party ecosystems as to how they need to wire up their applications to achieve these things. So here we're just showing what parts of the workflow specification um, look like in YAML when we've described all of that. And again, the beauty about YAML being a machine readable format is that we can rely on tooling to be built up to tell the story better for consumers. So instead of consumers having to digest the YAML structure, they can actually get a living graphical representation of the workflow itself. And then if we changed anything on the workflow on the left, the actual diagram on the right would, would update. So it becomes living documentation and it's assertable. We can ensure that the underlying APIs are able to conform and meet the expectations of this workflow uh, real time. So that's more or less it. Um, if you're interested in the status of the workflow, well, at the time of recording, um, we're more or less good to go. So the feedback round from the OpenAPI Technical Steering Committee and Technical Developer Communities has ended on December 1st. So the implementer draft is ready for launch. We're just dotting some I's and crossing some T's. And then we'll be updating the OpenAPI's website to include uh, the new specification and making it available to the broader industry. If you'd like to learn more about the specification, here's the URL to the specification. There's also a URL to uh, an examples repository. Uh, so we're covering uh, OAuth uh, dances, we're covering financial grade push, author uh, push authorization requests, which again, it's quite hard for these things to be documented purely in, in OpenAPI, for example, right now, hence a very, very valid use case for the workflow specification. One about lo login and retrieve pets, which is kind of the example that I walked through, and then another one for, for pet coupons. So that's it. Thank you very much, everyone. Hopefully you really can see that the workflow specification is something very exciting uh, that we're working on under the Open API initiative. And we really do think it's the missing piece of the API puzzle. Thank you.